if that very good it sure is uh so hi everybody thanks for coming to our weekly u of t physics colloquium um so today we're very lucky to have professor mariangela lisanti from princeton as our speaker uh, mariangela did her phd at stanford before moving to princeton and she's a leader in the study of dark matter theories and collider physics in recent years, she's done a lot of groundbreaking work on new astrophysical probes of dark matter, uh, and we'll be hearing about some of that cool stuff today. So please join me in welcoming Mariangela. And because of the online format, uh, we're going to do questions at the end. So uh, you know the drill. OK, take it away, Mariangela. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. Uh, and, and thank you for the invitation to join you all virtually today. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm starting on my opening slide here with an image of the Nyx goddess. And this is intended to be a bit of a teaser. Um, this is a Greek goddess that will come back to our story later in the talk. So um, this is just kind of meant to uh, pique your interest and uh, that way you can kind of stay tuned to see where she makes an appearance in the story that we're going to, um, to discuss today. So what I'm going to be telling you a little bit about is some work that my group has been doing over the last few years, um, attempting to map the dark matter halo locally, so near the solar position in the galaxy, um, using data from the Gaia satellite. Um, the primary application of this is to um, direct detection experiments. So these are terrestrial experiments that are seeking to discover dark matter. Um, and those experiments rely on having an accurate map of the, um, both the, the local number density and also the velocity distribution of the, of the dark matter halo. So let me start by just um, giving a bit of a historical introduction to um, what we believe or have been using for our, our dark matter map um, to date. Um, and this goes back to the 1970s and 1980s with the discovery of flat rotation curves, um, where we, you know, with work pioneered by Rubin and Ford, saw that the rotation velocity of galaxies similar to ours um, flattens out at large distances from the center of the galaxy, which is different than what's expected from the Newtonian prediction. There are several ways that you can explain this result. Um, one, way is to posit that the Newtonian gravity itself as a theory um, is failing and that we need to modify gravity um, in order to explain this. And modifications to gravity um, have received a bit of attention over the last few years. Um, they struggle, the, the models that have been posited struggle to be able to explain um, cosmology, cosmological signatures like the CMB. So that's been one of the primary challenges to um, at least the models that have been developed to date. Um, my group recently did um, another test of MOND type uh, modifications to gravity, um, looking more locally within our galaxy, um, precisely in the air range where these kinds of models are predicted to be most successful. Um, and what we were looking at was uh, comparing the radial accelerations of stars versus their vertical accelerations. Um, what modifications to gravity do is essentially enhance the radial accelerations of stars um, such that at, at far distances to bring them in line with the flat rotation curve uh, results. Um, but when you do this, the theory also simultaneously enhances the vertical accelerations of those stars. Um, and so we can actually just go into the data and see whether those enhancements in the vertical accelerations um, exist. And what we find is that um, this is actually highly constrained by current surveys, um, which is a, an additional uh, piece of evidence that um, any kind of modification of gravity would need to, to really be able to, to meet. At, at this point, I, I see it as sort of being a, um, a challenge to, the, to this approach. Um, it, precisely in the region where these models are supposed to be successful. So what that leaves us with then is the second um, approach to explaining flat rotation curves, which is that we introduce additional mass in the galaxy. And in this framework, we can think of this as um, additional, let's call it dark matter. Um, so it's additional matter that's not emitting any light. And it surrounds the visible part of our galaxy in a very massive halo. Um, the extent of this halo is far, far greater than the extent of the visible part of the galaxy. 
um, specifically, the, you can think of the radius of this halo as being nearly 10 times the radius of the, the baryonic halo. Um, the dark matter particles that would be flying around in this halo are, in some sense, pretty boring. They don't really, they're not moving around at relativistic speeds or anything like that. Their average velocity is probably close to about 200 kilometers a second. Um, and uh, just the overall mass distribution in this halo needs to scale linearly with radius in order to be able to explain the data from flat rotation curves. Um, so this picture taken together um, is one way in which we can um, explain the flat rotation curve data. And for the purposes of any experiment where we actually really want to be able to directly detect these dark matter particles so that we can um, actually say something about its particle properties. So for example, what is the mass of the particle? How does it uh, actually interact with visible matter? Um, in any of that kind, those kinds of experiments, we want to be able to actually see the interactions of these particles, let's say in a terrestrial experiment, some, some lab here on Earth. Um, for example, in the diagram, the image I have here on the left, this is an experiment um, called Xenon 100. Um, at, at the moment, they're, they're running a much larger version, Xenon 110. Um, and this is essentially just a big tub of xenon. And what the experiment is doing is essentially waiting for a, a dark matter particle to fly through, um, collide with the nucleus in that detector. Um, the dark matter particle is obviously never going to be observed, but the uh, recoil energy that it imparts to that nucleus um, leads to a signal um, that, that can be detected. Now, the scattering rates in any of these kinds of experiments are going to depend on the phase space of the local dark matter. So as I said earlier, both on the, the number density of the dark matter in our corner of the galaxy, as well as the velocity distribution of the dark matter in our corner of the galaxy. Um, and these two uncertainties are perhaps one of the two largest systematic uncertainties that come into play when interpreting the results from these direct detection experiments. Um, so if we can get these uncertainties better under control, it would end up, it would ultimately end up helping us to decipher the actual fundamental properties of dark matter from any possible signal that, that we would record. The, um, the sort of the history for actually writing down a model for that local dark matter number density and velocity distribution um, follows pretty closely on the heels of the discovery of the flat rotation curves. So this is in very early work by Ostreicher and Peebles in the 1970s, and then um, Fries and Spurgel um, a little bit later than that. Um, and the goal here is how do we actually write down um, a model for this dark matter, not really knowing too much about it. Um, so we'll assume that it's a collisionless fluid um, and that the fluid mass is conserved. Um, so that's this initial assumption in this blue box here. And then if we add on to this a few other assumptions, so for example, we state that this dark matter is in steady state, that its velocities are isotropic, and that it ultimately would end up explaining a flat rotation curve, then taking these assumptions and combining it with the conservation equation, what falls out is that the number density of the dark matter is one over r squared, and that its velocities are just simple Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So this model was put forward very early on and has essentially become um, the standard in the field. It's actually referred to as the standard HALO model. Any um, result from a direct detection experiment that you see um, utilizes this model um, and the results, the limits are always presented assuming, for example, this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. What we have now is um, with new data that um, I'll, I'll be describing, um, an opportunity to revisit this HALO model and understand whether or not um, the assumptions that go into this model are actually the correct assumptions to be making, and then um, also understand what the modifications of the model um, would be if you alter those assumptions. Um, so specifically, what I want to do is focus on the assumption of steady state. So what does it actually mean for a galaxy like the Milky Way to be in steady state? Um, the way I like to think about it um, is in terms of the historical evolution of our galaxy. Um, in the cold dark matter framework, galaxies like the Milky Way grow by um, collisions with other smaller galaxies. Um, so in some ways, uh, like you can think of the Milky Way as sort of having eaten up smaller galaxies 
And as it does, um, it inherits the dark matter in the stars from those galaxies and it grows larger and larger um, over time. Now that merger history, so the, the, the way in which the historical evolution by which you've had these collision events, um, you know, we can, we can consider two separate extremes for that. So in, in one extreme where the history is pretty quiet, we had, first, let's say, a collision event a long, long time ago, two galaxies combined, um, and then they just kind of settled into place um, and had a long time to just sort of sit there, come into equilibrium, and then here we are today um, with our own, um, you know, Milky Way galaxy. And we can contrast this to a much more active history where um, a lot of galaxies um, would have combined over time, um, giving us our, our Milky Way today. And in the first case here on the left, where our, the Milky Way has a chance to sort of come into equilibrium over time, that's the limit where the steady state hypothesis um, would be uh, correct. And where the derivation that I showed on the previous slide um, would, would fit well with the picture. But if we have a much more active merger history as depicted here on the right, um, that would uh, challenge that steady state assumption and bring into question the, the model that we've been using um, all these years. So um, you know, our, our need to be able to describe the local dark matter history actually requires us to understand a much uh, bigger problem, which is how does, how does our, our galaxy actually evolve to the point um, that, we, that we see it today? Uh, so over the course of this talk, um, I'm going to discuss that and also show uh, what we've been able to learn with data from the Gaia satellite. Um, the first part of the talk is going to focus um, more on the theoretical foundation um, for how to interpret the results from the satellite. Um, so I'll be showing you some results that we've obtained using um, numerical simulation and um, walking you through what actually happens to the dark matter as two galaxies collide. Um, in let's say in, in the Milky Way. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll um, walk you through the kinds of analyses we've been doing with Gaia to actually reconstruct our galaxy's history um, and be able to say something about the dark matter map near, near the sun's position. <clears throat> so let me show, start by just showing you a movie of um, a galaxy that's similar in mass to the Milky Way. Um, this is uh, modeled using um, the FIRE simulation, where FIRE here stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. So this simulation tracks both the dark matter, the stars, and the gas in um, a galaxy of similar mass to ours, starting at very early times, um, all the way up until the present day. The movie that I'm going to show you only will show the stars in you know, sort of where the stars are in this process. Um, but just keep in mind that um, the simulation is also simultaneously keeping track of the dark matter. So let me get, get this running. I'll run it through once and then kind of come back and highlight some, some of the points. So we're, we're nearing the end here. And in this last phase, you can see, you know, here's the stellar disk. Um, and there's not really that much activity. But if we rewind this back and watch this again, in the initial stages, the process is pretty violent. So you're getting a lot of these collisions um, and uh, a lot of materials kind of getting stripped and moved around and it's pretty chaotic. And here later on in time, the number of these little mergers um, reduces, they become smaller and that disk is, is more stable. So it actually survives um, with time. So what I want to do now is just kind of break this down, starting from, um, you know, kind of step by step. So as I have one of these satellite galaxies falling in, what actually happens to the dark matter and the stars in that system? Um, and how does that evolve as I let the system, um, as I let time progress? So let's start off just in that initial point. So I've got my galaxy, my Milky Way, so that's represented uh, diagrammatically here by this disk. And there's a little sat smaller satellite galaxy that starts falling in. So it's gotten caught by the tidal pull of our, our galaxy. Um, in the initial stage, as this satellite galaxy starts falling in, it is going to experience um, the gravitational force from our um, 
larger Milky Way. And these gravitational tidal forces are going to be stripping the dark matter and the stars in that satellite galaxy um, off, off of the galaxy. The material that gets stripped off um, is just left behind. Um, it's essentially just kind of litters our own galaxy. Um, and in the initial stages, it very roughly kind of tracks the path that the satellite galaxy took as it, as it falls in. Um, this leads to essentially a, a tidal stream that forms. Um, and we see evidence for these tidal streams in the Milky Way. Perhaps the most um, famous of these is the stellar stream that's left behind by the merger of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. So this is just a movie of that merger happening. And in the case of Sagittarius, the dwarf itself actually has not been completely disrupted. So we can still see the dwarf in its current position, but we can also make out these um, wings of the tidal stream um, that it has left behind. So in this movie, the actual Sagittarius is roughly around here. And you know, if we could evolve this further in time, Sagittarius will ultimately just end up being completely disrupted, um, but it hasn't quite reached that point yet. So tidal streams are um, a pretty spectacular signature of these kinds of mergers. Um, they tend to occur um, pretty, you know, like, as I said, like pretty soon after the, the galaxy starts falling in. If we consider a point in time a little bit later, um, once the satellite galaxy falls in and then makes several different orbits, um, you can think of this as essentially winding up all of those streams that it leaves behind. And with time, um, the beautiful, very clean signature that you see of a signal st sing single stream um, essentially gets washed out. And what's left just looks like kind of a cloud of tidal debris that's left behind. Um, and what's, you know, even though spatially that material does not um, have anything, you know, interesting, there aren't really that many interesting features that are there spatially. Um, what's interesting is that the velocity um, behavior of the material left behind can still have some, some uh, interesting features left uh, in it. So for example, um, this is just looking at one of these not so re recent mergers in the fire galaxy. Uh, I'm just plotting here the radial velocity of the material that's left behind by this um, merger. And the dark matter is from that merger is shown in dark blue and the stellar material that's removed from that merger is shown in pink. And um, you can see a couple of things. One is that um, the velocity distribution has this kind of bimodality to it, um, which is an indication that, um, it, that it's, um, the system hasn't equilibrated. So if it has equilibrated, you'd expect this to look more just like a simple Gaussian. Um, the other thing that's kind of note noteworthy about this is that you can see that both the stars and the dark matter um, their velocity distributions seem to track each other um, quite, quite well. And the final stage of this is sort of the oldest mergers, the ones that came in a really long time ago. So they came in, they initially formed tidal streams as they were falling in, then that material got all wound up, um, forming a, you know, a kind of a cloud of stuff left behind. Um, so the position information gets washed out, but we still see the velocity behavior. Um, but then if we let that evolve even further, what ultimately happens is that that material will just equilibrate with the Milky Way as a whole. And what we'll see today is um, really no interesting features in position space or in velocity space. So um, here I'm showing material that's left behind by some of the oldest mergers in this fire simulation. Um, again, starting here, just the, the radial velocity. Uh, dark matter is in black and the stars from these mergers are shown in red. Um, and because this material came in so early and has had a chance to equilibrate um, over time, um, the velocity distribution just looks Gaussian. So um, we've lost some of the interesting um, bimodality features that we saw in the previous slide. Um, and then the other point to make is that again, we're seeing that the dark matter here, the dark matter distribution is tracing the distribution from, from the stars. Um, and while I'm here, I'm just showing a signal velocity coordinate, we see the same behavior even when we look at the other two velocity distributions. So let's take this all together and kind of talk about what our plan of attack is going to be if what we want to do is create a map of the local dark matter. 
Um, what we need to do is understand how that dark matter was dragged into our location in the galaxy. And the way in which it can be dragged in is um, through these mergers. Some of the mergers will have stars in them and we'll refer to those as luminous. So the luminous satellite galaxies that came in. And some of the mergers, um, if the, the satellite galaxies are pretty small, um, there will no, not be any stars in, in those galaxies. Um, now, this case here, the non-luminous one is, um, is particularly challenging. Um, and at the moment, what we've been ta decided to tackle is just the left. So we're starting um, by trying to understand um, what's been left behind by these luminous satellite galaxies. Um, and then under this category, then we want to know of the luminous satellite galaxies that have contributed material to our local area in the galaxy, how much came from the really old mergers, how much came from some of these not so recent mergers, and how much came from you know, very recent mergers. And the reason I divided these up into these three categories is that their position, the material left behind would carry different position and velocity features depending on um, where, where we fall here. So this set of mergers would leave um, tidal streams. This set of mergers um, would leave um, pretty much just velocity substructure, no position, um, interesting position information. And this stuff here would leave material that's all pretty much equilibrated um, by today. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you how we've been filling in this part here of the diagram. And the reason we've been able to make progress in this direction is due to incredible data that's coming out of the, the Gaia satellite mission. Um, so Gaia is the follow-up astrometric survey to the Hipparchos mission, which ran in the late 1980s, early 1990s. It was launched in December of 2013 and had its second data release in April 2018. Um, and it is providing measurements for over a billion stars in the galaxy, which is about 1% of all of the Milky Way stars. Um, so this is a, a huge step forward in terms of the, um, the amount and quality of data that we had um, going back to Hipparchos. And to kind of drive home that point, um, this is an image um, of the galaxy, the galactic disk, but rotated by 90 degrees, so it's vertical here. Um, here's the sun, and this small little dash circle around it is the range where Hipparchos was able to get um, stellar distances to good accuracy. Um, the comparable range for Gaia, so to sort of match that same um, level of accuracy, goes out much, much further. So that's indicated here by this circle. Um, and ultimately, Gaia is going to be able to do well at measuring um, motions accurate up to about a kilometer a second, all the way out here to this circle that's kind of getting cut off by the slide. So what's the task? The task is to go into the Gaia data set and to try to find um, which stars there actually came from some of these mergers. If we can identify those, then we can um, piece together some information from um, you know, the properties of the mergers. And then based off of that, then also try to figure out where the dark matter from those mergers ended up. So this is a bit of a fossil hunt. Um, in the way that, you know, same way that if you go on an archaeological dig um, and you find a fossil and you look at the shape of the fossil or its environment, um, maybe you do some radioactive dating, you're going to pull together all of that information and then try to infer something about the creature that that fossil came from. Um, we're going to do something similar, but with the Gaia data. So what we have now is going to be, you know, information about the positions of stars, their velocities, perhaps their chemical abundance. And then based off of that information, what we want to do is infer something about um, perhaps some merger that occurred a long, long time ago um, that contributed to the growth of our galaxy. Now, the top left panel here is actually the Gaia data. And if you can see that most of the, like where, where the map here is brightest is here, which is just the galactic disk. The vast majority of the stars that Gaia is observing are ones that were just born in our galaxy, so not ones that came from these mergers. So what we, um, so this search is really when we are literally trying to find a needle in a haystack. We're trying to find very rare stars um, that could point us to some interesting um, historical note about our galaxy. So. We've taken a few approaches to doing this and I'll, I'll present both of them. So I'm gonna start off with the first one, which I'm gonna call human-centric. 
Um, and this is in contrast to the second approach, which will be machine centric. So um, what we have on our hands is essentially a big data problem. Um, Gaia data is huge, and we're trying to find rare events in this huge data set. Um, if we want to do this uh, in, the, so in approach one, what we're gonna do is just impose restrictions on the data that can minimize the amount of contamination that you're getting from stars that we do not think are associated with these mergers. Um, and so obviously, you know, in order to get the, the cleanest handle on this, we're gonna be very conservative and place very tight restrictions to try to remove as much of these, let's call them background um, as possible. And the work that I'm gonna talk about um, was uh, led by um, postdoc Lena Nassib, who is uh, starting a new postdoc actually now at, at the Carnegie Institute. Um, so as I mentioned, in this approach, we're going to try to be very conservative. We want to try to pick out those rare stars that came from the mergers, and we want to ignore as best as possible stars that would be associated with the Milky Way's disk. So to do this, we will um, specifically focus and place a cut on the spatial range that we're going to look at. Like, and we're literally just cutting out everything. We're not even going to look anywhere inside the disk. We're just going to look in the region, this region here above the disk, and below the disk. Again, this is an attempt to be very conservative and just remove anything that we, this region here where we know we're gonna be dominated by um, stars that are not going to be associated with these mergers. Um, even when we place these very strict cuts on spatial cuts, um, we're still going to get contamination from disk stars. So we'll need to employ additional discrimination criteria. Um, so to do that, we can use information, for example, about the ages of those stars, um, for which we use chemical abundance as a proxy, um, and also just their velocities. So for one example is if we just look at the um, velocities of stars in the disk, um, the stars that would be associated with the Milky Way's disk would be rotating, so we'd expect them to fall in this plot here um, in the upper right. Um, they'd also be fairly young, so that would put them um, on the y-axis, it would put them up here. And in contrast, the stars that would be associated with these mergers um, would not necessarily be rotating with the disk. So we'd expect them to be um, here. And they would typically tend to be older than the disk stars. So um, a bit lower here on this y-plane. <clears throat> so what we have here is actually a clustering problem. Um, the data out of the box looks something like this. Um, I'm showing here three different panels. Um, the left panel has radial velocity, then this is um, angular velocity in the theta direction and in the phi direction. And the y-axis is um, chemical abundance. But if you're not unfamiliar with that notation, you could think of this as a proxy for age. So anything up at the top would be younger stars and at the bottom would be older stars. So out of the box, this is what the data looks like. And you know, the simple schematic I showed on the previous slide, um, you know, it, it may be a little bit hard to see how that trend, you know, applies over to this case, because now it just looks like we have a big blob of stuff. Um, and so what you want to do is to have um, apply a Gaussian mixture analysis to figure out how many different individual clusters of things are in this full data set. Um, so here, when we do that Gaussian mixture analysis is the result of what we find. The circles here are not ones I've drawn in by hand. Those are actually coming out from doing a full likelihood analysis um, where we're finding that there is evidence for three separate populations um, in this um, total, total data set. So this is literally just that it's, it's a standard kind of clustering um, problem. Um, the three populations are associated with the following. So the green here would be the stars that are associated with the galactic disk. The, um, the red um, would be the ones that are associated with the oldest stars. So the ones that probably came in from the oldest mergers. And when you look at how these are just in each of these different velocity components, their dispersion in each of the velocity directions is roughly the same. So it, it's pretty isotropically distributed in velocity space. And then the blue cyan contour here is, um, is intriguing, primarily because it, um, 
it, it's a bit more, it, the stars here are, are older than the disk stars, but younger than um, these really old ones here. Um, and additionally, when you look at it in the radial velocity coordinate, it's sort of squashed and, and um, definitely looks like it has a, a it's radially biased. Um, and so in terms of our understanding of how these could map onto the dark matter, um, the things that are of interest, potential interest, are the pink here, which if this is associated with the oldest mergers in our galaxy, that would be telling us something about um, the component of dark matter that's coming from these really old mergers. And then this scion component here, which if it's coming from a not so recent merger, um, might be telling us something about a component of dark matter that's in substructure. Um, so that uh, not so recent merger uh, actually has a name. Uh, it's called Gaia Enceladus, and it was first um, posited by Vasily Belokurov's group and Amina Helmi's group um, pretty soon after the second Gaia data release came out. Um, the movie that I'm showing here is um, an image is is actually just showing the the fall in of a galaxy uh, of Enceladus and what it would look like ultimately once it's disrupted. So I could get that movie going again. Um, so the red clump here would be Enceladus as it's just beginning to fall in. Um, it should start going in soon, there we go. And now it's gonna be tidally disrupted as it continues several passes um, through the Milky Way. And then at the end, you can sort of see where all of its stellar material gets left behind. Um, and it's concentrated in the inner part of the galaxy. That's one of the um, key features of this particular merger. Uh, so coming back to what this tells us about um, our family tree, um, this is an important uh, um, piece of information in terms of kind of reducing down um, our the number of possibilities. Uh, what it tells us is that about 7 billion years ago, there was a fairly significant merger um, that came in. And at that time, this Gaia Enceladus was probably about 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 times the mass of the sun. Um, so it, it pins down one of our oldest neighbors, uh, not neighbors, um, uh, relatives. So it pins down one of our oldest relatives um, and uh, also indicates because this occurred uh, about 7 billion years ago means it's um, not too soon, but also not too early. Um, so it's precisely in a regime where we would, um, where we know from simulations that the dark matter that's left behind would not have had enough time to, um, to come into equilibrium. So if we take all of this together, um, what we, um, and extrapolate to the dark matter, and I, I'll just give you kind of the final result here, and I don't have time to kind of go into detail in terms of the, um, full uh, steps that we take in doing this extrapolation. But what we find is from the, the stellar component that about 40% of the stars um, near, near us in the Milky Way are in, came in from these really old mergers and about 60% came in from this new relative Enceladus. And when we do the appropriate extrapolation to the dark matter that would have come from um, these same sources, what we find is about 60% of the dark matter would have come from these very old mergers and about 40% would have come from, from Enceladus. Um, so that already like starts filling in some parts of this diagram here on the left. Um, we're seeing evidence for material that came in very early on and then also material that came in a bit more recently from this new merger that's called Enceladus. Um, and what we want to know is, is there anything that came in even more recently than that? And that takes us to um, the second approach and the last thing um, that I want to highlight. Um, so this is taking a machine-centric approach. Um, now what we want to do is let a machine determine whether or not a star is coming from a merger or whether or not it was born in the disk. Um, and this part of the work uh, was led by Lena Nassib and also uh, Brian Ostiak, who's a postdoc at Harvard. So before we were extremely conservative in the cuts that we placed and we were specifically trying to avoid looking at anywhere close inside this disk because we knew that we would be largely contaminated by disk stars in this regime. And indeed only about 1% of the stars here um, originate from, um, from galaxy mergers. Um, so we're really, really uh, looking for very rare events here. 
Um, now that we're going to let a machine, we're going to throw this problem to a machine, um, we decided to just tackle this, go right to where the hard problem was and to see if we can have the machine actually distinguish of the stars in this regime, which ones um, are disk stars and which ones came from the mergers. Um, so to do this, we used uh, neural networks. Um, essentially, this is a classification problem. So kind of the characteristic or, or the, the very common uh, example for classification networks is you train on a picture of cat and pictures of dogs. And uh, the network learns how to distinguish these two. Um, so it starts off with these labeled photos. And then um, you apply your network to some other photo that you happen to have. And the network, given what it's learned from the labeled um, training set, can then distinguish and identify whether or not um, this new photo here is a cat or a dog. So what we want to do is going to be similar, except instead of working with pictures of cats or dogs, we want to instead work with um, simulation images or simulation information of stars, where the stars are labeled as either being um, born in the Milky Way or um, born from inside one of these mergers that got dragged in. Um, if you know, the only reason that we have any shot at having this work is because the quality of the simulations have gotten really good um, recently. Um, on this slide I'm showing on the top is a mock catalog of, uh, of the Milky Way galaxy. And on the bottom is the actual Gaia data. Um, what's going into this mock catalog is all the information about the hydrodynamics of how our system is built, how our galaxy is built up. So information on the gas, the, the stars, there's feedback that's fed into it, dark matter is also there. And um, it's quite remarkable that um, many of the features in this mock catalog reproduce what we're seeing in the Gaia data. It's not perfect, um, but considering the fact that perhaps decade, you know, a decade or so ago, um, these simulations couldn't even reproduce um, stable disks, it's quite remarkable um, the level of like how far and how sophisticated the simulations themselves have gotten. Um, so what our, we're going to do then is to use these simulations to train on them. These are essentially going to be our label data sets. And then we're going to apply um, the results to the Gaia data. Um, so I won't go into the, the nitty gritty details for all of this. Um, we, we did really. A, huge amount of, of testing to make sure that this worked. And I could probably give a whole, you know, another whole hour seminar on that. Um, but very, very briefly, um, what we start with are the simulated galaxies. Um, we train on stars there because, because it's a simulation, we actually know the origin of those stars. So th that's our label data set. Then we apply um, what's called transfer training. So we um, retrain the last layer of the network using a very small subset of actual real data that we think um, has a high, um, high purity uh, identification of disk versus um, uh, halo stars. And then we apply, ultimately apply the network to the actual Gaia data. Um, so after applying this process, um, what we can do is we can actually build a new catalog um, of stars that the network predicts are coming from mergers. And what I'm showing here in the bottom is a is are the velocities of all of the stars that the network has predicted to be born outside of our galaxy. Um, and again, then we have to apply a clustering um, algorithm to this to identify the individual pieces um, that are distinctive in this um, three dimensional space. And what we find are the following. So the pink here. Um, is corresponds to the stars that came in from the earliest mergers. The blue cyan um, corresponds to the stars that came in from our new relative Enceladus. Um, so this is actually interesting because it shows us that Enceladus also dumped a bunch of stuff right close to where the sun is, um, which is important for, for um, underlining the fact that that dark matter from Enceladus will be relevant for any kind of terrestrial search. Um, and then in addition, we find a new structure, which is shown here in green. And this we've called Nyx after the Greek goddess of the night. So that was the image that I actually started off my talk with. Um, <clears throat> and the stars that the clustering algorithm finds as being uh, associated with this Nyx structure are, um, are really quite, their, their kinematics are really interesting. So they have a very high radial velocity, so almost 200 kilometers a second. 
and they are um, rotating um, close to, but not exactly, um, with the speed of the sun um, around the center of the galaxy. The, their orbits are very eccentric. Um, if you want a way to kind of visualize this a bit better, um, this is looking at all of those stars in that stream um, in a top-down view of the galactic disk, so X and Y here. Here's the sun moving up in this coordinate frame, and each little purple arrow here is a star that the, is associated with Nix. And you can see by eye that the, um, the, the motion of these stars is very coherent. Um, and it also, um, that their orbits are more eccentric than what we expect from, from the sun. So this is uh, it, an intriguing structure that, that we find and it's streamlike, which suggests that if it did come from a merger, that that merger would have probably occurred fairly recently. Um, and the, uh, our next step is uh, to confirm the origin of these stars. Um, there's a variety of tools that we can use to help clarify whether or not these stars actually came from a galactic merger. We can look, for example, at the star's chemical abundances. We can try to infer something about their ages. Um, unfortunately, even though we see about 200 of these stars um, that have this, um, that are in this stream, very few of them um, have associated chemical abundances. Of the very few, so we only have about a handful that we see the chemical abundances for, um, the, the abundances look disc-like, but um, would not necessarily be inconsistent with coming from a merger as well. Um, so really to be able to completely and robustly uh, break this degeneracy between these two possible explanations, what we need is dedicated follow-up spectroscopy of these stars. And that work is actually currently underway. So there is a, a team from Caltech that um, has run a bunch of these um, observations over um, the summer and is currently analyzing these results. Um, and uh, their study should be able to shed some light as to whether or not the stars that we're identifying in Nix originated from the disk or are truly from one of these galactic mergers. Now, as a dark matter physicist, the reason that I care about this Nix stream is that the kind of, if it did originate from a galactic merger, um, what it would have left behind is um, a dark matter disk. So we ordinarily just think of the dark matter in our galaxy as being, um, distributed in this massive halo. Um, in order to have a stream that's aligned with our plane, similar to what we're seeing with Nix, um, that galaxy that would have created Nix would have also created um, essentially a, a large puffy dark matter disk that's surrounding our visible disk and rotating with it. So in this new picture, we would have a dark matter halo. And then inside of it, we'd also have a puffy little dark matter disk that's rotating um, around the, the center of the galaxy. Um, to better understand exactly what uh, the properties of this dark matter disk would be, how it forms, how it kind of correlates with what we're seeing from the Nix stars, um, we are actually running some dedicated simulations. This is work that's being led by an undergrad here at Princeton, Ben Dodge. Um, and so he's running simulations that track the infall of galaxies um, small satellite galaxies as they get torn apart and then form um, structures that uh, look like uh, Nix. And then we can also, from the simulation, see where the, the dark matter ends up. And the dark matter always ends up looking like this puffy, rotating dark matter disk. Um, so I think, you know, with the follow-up spectroscopy, um, we'll really get a good understanding as to whether or not Nix is originating from these galactic mergers. And if it is, then um, we'll really need to understand in detail from simulations like this exactly what the properties of that rotating dark matter disk would be and what the implications would be for any terrestrial dark matter um, search. Um, so this new result here with Nix is filling in a new part here of the puzzle. There's a question mark because we have yet to confirm um, whether or not it really is going to be correlated with the local dark matter distribution. Um, but that's something that we should be able to answer within the next year. And uh, just to mention very briefly some work that we have um, going on in progress um, with uh, a large group of postdocs and uh, students at Princeton um, in, in moving this forward and trying to maximize the amount of information that we can get from the Gaia data, 
um, you know, everything I've told you is just using the small subset of Gaia data that actually has whole three-dimensional velocity information. Um, but there's an even larger fraction of the Gaia data that is missing some of that velocity information, and in particular, missing the line of sight velocity. So one of the things we're working on now is asking whether or not we can use regression neural networks to actually guess what that missing kinematic piece of information is. Um, and if that neural network approach works um, successfully, then that would allow us to, um, it would greatly expand the working data that we can um, look at to find, you know, to do clustering and find um, evidence for, for these mergers. So with that, um, I'll just conclude um, by starting where we, um, by going back to where we began. So um, when the start of the talk, I presented our initial picture of what the dark matter distribution in our galaxy looked like, which was based off of observations from the flat rotation curves. Um, but with the new data that's been coming from Gaia, it's allowed us to revisit that. Um, and by using information about stellar substructure, um, combining that with what we're learning from state-of-the-art numerical simulations about the correlations between stellar distributions and dark matter, we can piece that all together to build up um, an empirical model for the halo. Um, and then, you know, with the ultimate goal being that we could um, have a, a, a detailed model where we understand the uncertainties and can quantify the uncertainties going into that halo model and use that um, uh, to give us, to shed light on some of the terrestrial searches for dark matter that are ongoing. So with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any questions. Um.